And George, you're going to talk to us about speech access and all the other next one. I think it's joint work. Joint work with who? Part of it is joint. Okay. With some people are here, some people are not here. Let's so, yeah. Thank you. So, um, yeah, speech acts, which I think you, you all know, uh, you all have an idea what that, that those are, and uh, the logical taxi commission I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes. And the idea, this talk is a, a summary of a bunch of things that I've done um, with Lucas Project. So, the first thing is a shout out to my co authors. Uh, this is the papers that the work you will be seeing in a minute is taken from. And what I will be talking about, uh, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna take a, take a ride into uh, issues in linguistics and a little bit of logic. Uh, and the idea uh, is um, we can uh, talk about speech acts as expressing attitudes such as acceptance and rejection and see that they do a bunch of uh, nice uh, things for us when we try to explain uh, aspects of language, in particular of language evolution. So this is the observation I would like to begin with. Uh, it's, uh, it's the observation that natural languages include simple words uh, for some, but not all of the operators you know, can have in classical logic. Uh, and by simple, I mean uh, one thing. So essentially think about words of one syllable. Right? So Larry Horn, uh, this linguist noticed a long time ago that uh, among the connectives, uh, natural languages include words, may include words for conjunction, and disjunction, or negated disjunction, uh, that would be nor, but there is no word for negated conjunction, something you could imagine uh, pronounce man. Uh, and likewise for any of the other Boolean connectives, there is no single word for the biconditional, for example, right? We have to say if and only if. Uh, and this is puzzling, um, you know, because why would that be? Uh, so here's a very simple impressionistic survey of word languages just to show you what the possible vocabulary is here for the connectives are. We have languages like English. Um, um, there, are there are languages that contain conjunction and disjunction, uh, and there are languages that only contain conjunction and only contain disjunction, and the way they express other things varies. Uh, there's a number of questions you can ask about this table, why the connect words for the connectors would be distributed this way. Uh, but in particular, I'm going to be focusing on the question, why should this be, spe the connected be, sp be special? So why would it be that and or and or um, are the only connectives that appear and not others. Um, so you might also know that Horn's observation applies also to the determinants of words that express specification, but I'm not going to talk about them. And that there are uh, existing accounts in the literature on this, uh, but I will be talking about them only at the end if I have time, which I probably will not have. But I am happy to talk about them in Q&A. Now, so this is uh, more to impress upon you that there's something weird that we need to explain. Um, th if you think about the connectives in the standard way uh, that we learn in baby logic courses, uh, these are just the distribution of truth values, right? You have conjunction, it's true if both the conjuncts are true or the was false. You got disjunction, you got nor. Why would man not be, uh, why would there be no words to, ex to express name? Now, this is interesting for various reasons here are some, because the question of what to be lexicalized gets at the distinction between what the child learns or can learn during the acquisition period, these are the words that get stored in long term memory in the lexicon, versus what be must be expressed composition by combining the lexical entries. Uh, so here you get uh, also potentially insights into uh, the study of compositionality, why we have this, you know marvelous property of languages uh, to express, uh, you know, virtually every meanings uh, by combination of simple ones. Um, we get to uh, look into the, basically what are the cognitive primitives or the basic building blocks of our reasoning. Um, uh, and 
Um, finally, uh, but this is just for the particular type of approach that I will take, uh, I think there's something interesting to say about the logical speech hacks. Okay. Um, more on setting up the problem. Uh, you might be familiar with the classical Aristotelian square of positions, uh, which you can carve up in this way. Um, and the observation, points of observations that the like connectives that we can find in natural language occupy three of the four corners. For some reason, one is not there. Um, there are, one running theme of this talk will be that uh, conjunction and disjunction are operators that coordinate assertions. So, or you know, positive speech acts. Uh, this is why they're on the bottom side here. And then nor and then if it existed, would coordinate rejections. This is sort of intuitive. Um, um, but that's important to set up the problem. And here's what I'm going to do today. Uh, I'm going to give you two ideas, one dynamic and one static, um, of why what's special about Endor and Nor. Uh, the dynamic idea is, uh, well, I'm going to tell you more about what they are. Now I want to, to just say, I don't really know what the connection is between these two. I'm still working out. Um, how exactly to combine them. Um, so maybe we can talk about that at the end. But the key distinction that both these models uh, rely on is that um, we must uh, make a you know make a distinction between the logic of rejection and the logic of negation. Those things are going to be related but different. And this is of course something you are all familiar here, familiar with here. Um, if you've seen uh, the uh, amount of work on bilateralism. Um, and now I'm going to, uh, and, and both of these uh, approaches exploit this distinction. So I'm going to begin with this dynamic part. So here's the idea is to express the connectives, or from, model the connectives as context change operators. What, so here's a bit of background. The background should be very familiar. It's, less, it's like Solnaker stuff. So a context is a set of possibilities that are shared with interlocutors. A uh, conversation is something like a process of collective belief revision. So the interlocutors are saying things and they are making an effort to narrow down the set of possibilities to find out which possible one is actual. Uh, in this, I guess, this philosophical background, an update is going to be a transition from uh, an initial state of the context to, uh, to the next state of the context. And then uh, following uh, what Sonica says about assertion, we can think of these updates. And so uh, uh, updates are, are going to be uh, brought about by speech acts like assertion and rejection. We think about assertion as comprising two stages. So there's an initial phase in which the speaker makes a proposal to add information. Then the idea is that the proposal is accepted and it comes into effect by restricting the possibilities that are available. Um, some possibilities are eliminated because they're incompatible with the proposal. All of this is uh, under the usual idealizations uh, that the interlocutors are cooperative, um, um, that um, I'm almost idealizing away from presupposition failure, from all that, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's very much ideal philosophical language in the sense that, like when I was talking about yesterday, that they don't like. Uh, but, um, uh, on with these idealizations. Now, you usually talk in the Stomacharian literature on context change like this, you usually talk about assertion um, down to keep with the bilateral assumption. I'm going to uh, basically make the same, uh, think, to talk, talk about rejection in the same way. So, rejection is going to be a proposal to remove information and then to eliminate the possibilities accordingly. Uh, and the, the idea here is really that assertion and rejection of speech acts are completely on a part. Uh, and then finally, in particular, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this idea of modeling updates as belief revision quite literally, quite literally, and I'm gonna be um, looking at the belief revision literature for formalizing these two stages: proposal and restriction. Um, so. This is in particular what that's going to mean. You think about context as order sets. So there are sets of possibilities. The possibilities are entirely classical, as I, as I mentioned. So there's a classical evaluation function. And then there's an order on them. 
Why? Because uh, so the idea from Stormaker is you have possibilities that are live for the interlocutors, right? But then that's not the end of it because some possibilities are more likely than others. These are supposed to be the words that might be actual. As far as they know, some are more likely than others, and that's what the, the less than relation um, uh, formalizes, that um, W and V stand in this relation, just in case W is at least as likely to be actual as V. Now, we're always using these pre-orders. Here's what I want to say, that proposals, so the first phase of the update by an assertion, what it's going to do is going to modify the likelihood. Um, and so the, the effect of proposing that putting forward phi as an assertion uh, is this uh, introduces this new likelihood, this new relation of uh, being as uh, at least as likely to be actual as, in which um, um, W comes before V, just in case W is a fine word and V is not a fine word, and everything else stays the same, which is what this means. So in other words, to give you maybe a very sharp understanding of what's going on, here's your logical, here's your context set of, set of possibilities. When you have a proposition phi, the words inside the circle make phi true. And then uh, you, you have certain ordering among any, any two points. The, this updated ordering tells you that if v, w is in here and v is outside, then w is, is at least as likely as v. And otherwise, maybe if both the dot, if both dots are inside or both are the outside, then it's the ordering that you had in the initial context. <laughs> okay. Um, so that gives a straightforward definition of proposal. What happens when you have an initial context and you propose to add uh, an atomic formula P? Well, uh, you just get the same possibilities, but with the P words coming before all others. And, and then you, you can do exactly the same for rejection, but opposite. And so now it's going to be that the words in which the uh, proposition is false uh, that are going to be uh, more, uh, uh, more likely. And that allows us to define uh, negative proposals in the obvious way. And that's the first step of an update. The second step, um, I'm, I'm assuming idealizing that all of this stuff goes through without objections from the interlocutors. And what happens then is uh, you generate a new context by restricting the set of possibilities uh, by keeping, basically, by keeping only the minimal words in the ordering, by keeping only the best words. Um, and that uh, can be defined easily if you define that you get the, the mean of a context is just a set of words, that, a set of words W that come before all others in the ordering. And then but on the basis of this, uh, I, uh, uh, this is an execution function. It's the idea that the uh, proposal gets executed. And what happens then is that the domain of the context is restricted to the best words, and so is the ordering. Question? OK. So now, uh, with this material, with this, I, I, what I did was I, I formalized a proposal function, which could be positive or negative, or atomic formulas. And then the execution we take care of restricting according to the proposal, right? On the basis of this, here are the updates for assertion and rejection of P. You basically first place all of the P words uh, before the others and then eliminate the non-P words. And with the rejection, the opposite happens. So you can intuitively see that the results of these two operations are complements of each other. Crucially, this is, yeah, okay. And now the next step is uh, Stonecker's rule. What that is, is with this is something Stonecker said a while ago, it's uh, sort of an adequacy condition on updates, semantics. The, the idea is that the result of updating a set of possibilities with an assertion of phi is equivalent to the intersection of the set of possibilities with the static, the static proposition uh, expressed by phi. I'm going to say, OK, and I'm going to take this. Uh, constraint uh, as a condition to claim that if Stonecker rules hold, Stonecker's rule holds for complex sentences with an operator over a bunch of atomic arguments, then the update system encodes the operator. Example, 
conjunction can be encoded on the basis of these functions, proposal and execution as a sequence. So let me also give you the pictures because they're visual, I think they help. So you start by put placing all of these uh, words in P uh, uh, in saying that all of these are minimal according to the ordering, your preferred words. That's your proposal here. Then execution means you eliminate the others. Then you go on to saying that the two words are minimal. And then execution again eliminates the other. You end up with intersection, which is what you thought. You can do the same for disjunction, uh, still in terms of proposal and execution. So you place the few words among the minimal words. Then you say the Q words are also uh, better than the non Q words. And then execution and gets rid of the rest. And then that's the union. And so, 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 so far, what I said is you can formalize this tonicarianity of proposal and then uh, execution of the proposal using these uh, functions of uh, context. And you can, by doing that, encode uh, the conjunction and disjunction. Now, a very natural thought is okay, I also have this negative proposal. You switch around. Um, rejections for assertions, you should obtain negative operators. And the fascinating thing is you only obtain no. And the reason is that these two <coughs> procedures to update the context are equivalent. So the first one is, uh, the first one, what, what happens here, it's the same structure as the update by disjunction, but with, pro with negative proposal instead of positive. So first you highlight all of the few words as least preferred. You like the few words as least preferred, and then you eliminate the least preferred words. You end up with the words in the series in the white part of this uh, uh, final uh, diagram, which are all possibilities in which neither P nor, Q nor Q is true. Alternatively, so that's the meaning of no. Alternatively, you could highlight the few words as least preferred and throw them away by execution. I like the few words as least preferred and throw them again away. And you have, and then as you can see, you have the same two conditions. So what that means is that uh, we have functions on context that can encode conjunction, disjunction, and nor in the sense of Stonecker's rule, right? Because now I don't, Stonecker's rule is valid for for this because I obtained the meaning of no the meaning, the static meaning that I was expected to obtain, where neither, neither P nor Q is true. But Stonecker's rule fails for NAND. And I think that this uh, could be part of a, of a story about what's special concerning these connectives. So to recapitulate this first bit of the presentation, I introduced primitives motivated by Stonecker's conception of update, proposal and execution. I formalize the connectives as belief revision operators. Uh, that was the this is using standard material from, from, the, from the literature. And I've shown um, a simple uh, model on which, on which you can encode and or ignore, but not name. So Stonecker's rule fails. And so now you might be wondering, okay, but, but the, what, what do you mean? How we can ex how can we express the negation of conjunction? Uh, well, exactly as I said, negating conjunction. So we still need to introduce negation. Uh, again, the crucial idea here is that we must make a distinction between rejection and negation. Ne negation in update semantics is standardly taken to be the complement operation. Uh, so that, namely, the result of updating a context with an assertion of not phi is something like this. First, you uh, assert phi, and then you take that off of the initial input. Uh, context. Now, truth conditionally, uh, yeah, so uh, truth conditionally, uh, you can see that asserting the negation of P, which is this, so taking the complement of the assertion of P, is just the same as rejecting. But now something else is happening, right? So what's happening with this definition is that you are taking the input twice. You're taking it once to calculate the effect of a setting with P, and once to remove that from your initial step. And this is potentially significant, cognitively speaking. Of course, this is a kind of kind of a bold claim which I've not that tested. I, perhaps in the future I will be able to. But it's potentially significant 
for the following reason. One, first, because you increase the expressive power of the update system, because at, at this point now we can encode all bullets. Negation of conjunction, obviously, by taking the complement of an update by conjunction. And secondly, because this increase in expressive power seems to correspond to how natural language works, because a systematic way of expressing the negation of conjunction is by putting together negation and conjunction. You say not both T and Q. Okay. So now at this point, I, might, I think you might be feeling a little mystified because they said a bunch of things about uh, updates and belief revision and somehow classical logic is no longer, no longer holds. Uh, so now I, I'm going to start the second part of the presentation. Uh, and the second part begins as follows. Uh, that, uh, what really is crucial uh, about, um, well, a few things that are, are crucial to the explanation of what's special about Endor and North that I just gave you, um, but not the dynamicity, not the dynamic stuff, really, because there's, there's nothing um, you, you, you can call genuinely dynamic happening in the update system that I described, but because I was abstracted away from dynamic stuff like the systemic models and the you know, presuppositions that, that, that give rise to dynamic phenomena. Uh, and, and, and so that may lead you to think, okay, is there a static characterization of, uh, of this failure of this um, failure of NAND to be expressed uh, with the simplest primitives? And the answer is yes, and that's why this presentation is another 20 minutes long. Um, the, so that, this is what I will, will be calling a logical telexical. It's a formal system that captures on and only the semantic distinctions the natural language can express lexically. So, just to clarify, classical logic captures all of the semantic distinctions that natural language can express lexically, but not only that, because there's a lot of things you can define in classical logic that you don't find are simple words in the language. So, I want something uh, uh, that fits more what we observe across natural languages. Um, and the result uh, of this, uh, how much time do I have? 20. 20, 20. 20 minutes, okay, great. The result of this would be, uh, it's, it, you can think of it as a two, two tier model. The first level is uh, what the lexicon expresses just by using assertion and rejection. And that would be uh, um, like the details, but I'm gonna get into some nerdy stuff. It's, it's gonna be a bilateral state-based semantics. And I'm going to make a neglect your assumption. You don't know what that means, but I'm going to tell you in a second. I just, you should just know that uh, this comes, um, a lot of this will be in common with some recent work by Maria Loni. Uh, so, first level is what we, in the lexicon can model, what the lexicon can express with assertion and rejection. And then we get to the second level, adding negation, like ne prop, uh, negation as a, as a uh, in addition to just rejection. And that gives us, dropping uh, this requirement, that gives us classical logic, which presumably is something like a model of what natural language can express as a whole, <coughs> exploiting composition. So this is a, a figure that I like. Uh, you, you know, I started with the square root position that comes from Aristotle. What I want to do is characterize this semantic space, because that's uh, only uh, what you, it's, it's, it's uh, all you can find in the lexicon. And the way to do that, you know, through this data, is to keep uh, conjunction and disjunction with their ordinary semantics. That's familiar. But then their negations should collapse. So the classical duality of these two connectives should fail. And in particular, um, this, this the Morgan formulas, uh, which is what you get by negating a conjunction and disjunction, this should, should all be equivalent. Why? Because then you get to have only one point in the top half of the, of the uh, figure here. Um, and I should also, yeah. And furthermore, finally, this one point that you, um, that you obtain in the negative side, so to speak, that expresses the classical meaning of north. So one thing that's important here is don't think that this book here is the meaning of the word not, because it isn't. Um, I'll tell you what that is. So, 
just to be a little more precise, uh, how do you get to say that all of, all of these, uh, the moral formulas are equivalent? Well, because the log in the logic of the lexical connectives, what I want to indicate is uh, obtaining all of the classical entanglements. That's the ones you get in classical logic, plus all of the ones you don't get in classical logic. And so, because we get all of these, they're all equivalent. And finally, this one same meaning that they all express is the meaning of norm. So that's the only negative meaning we can express in this, in this logic. Now there's an initial problem, so uh, rather immediate. So and the problem is this. Start by assuming not phi, then you can infer not phi or not psi by disjunction introduction. But then that's equivalent to not phi and not psi. As I just argued, they should be equivalent because uh, I want to be able only to express one negative meaning. Therefore, not psi by conjunction elimination, and so it looks like the logic should be trivial. Um, so, what are we going to do about this? Well, um, here's the hunch. In natural language, and this might be not, not no more than an analogy, but in natural language, uh, there is this very strong tendency to infer two from one. So you say Paul might be Dutch or Danish, and native speakers immediately interpret that to mean or something to support it. Number two, Paul might be Dutch and might be Danish. And this is an inference from disjunction to conjunction, uh, which is not a split choice. Uh, and formally speaking, in some sense, it's, it's, it's very similar to the this inference here that I'm calling FC, which is my step, my going from Roman numeral two to Roman numeral three. Right. Formally speaking, is very similar, at least on the surface. And uh, a long time ago, Hans Kampen noticed that uh, if you just stipulate that free choice holds, then you get triviality results like that. So, so linguists have said a, a bunch of a bunch of different theories of free choice. So there's a bunch of different reasons why a bunch of different accounts of these triviality arguments. Uh, but what I will do, I will draw from Aloni's work on, on this and adjust to my own my own goals. So this is the uh, uh, technical part of, of, of this. So uh, a bilateral state-based semantics, what that means. So in the background, you assume models uh, which are just a non empty set of possible words and then classical relation functions. But we're going to be looking at states, which are subsets of W. Uh, so the idea is this. Uh, Word. So, you know, one thing is to evaluate the truth of a sentence at a word, that's going to be classical. Um, and another thing is to evaluate the assertability of a sentence or rejectability, or rather, whether a state, an information state asserts or rejects a sentence. And um, so, as I said, truth is going to be classical in, the, in this sense. The evaluation function at words is classical, but but the logical assertion and rejection doesn't have to be. Uh, so here's how we begin. Uh, we're giving conditions on atoms and then extending them to the rest of the language. Um, uh, an atomic formula will be asserted in a state, just in case all the words uh, verify it. And it's going to be rejected either if the state is empty, uh, so this is sort of trivially, or if the state fails to assert. Um, I'm calling this a polar rejection to, to impress upon you the idea that it, the, well, that a state rejects the either in the trivial case uh, or um, in the non-trivial case if it's the polar opposite of assertion, like when we just have one word, one word in which P is false. Um, and I mentioned here also that the, the empty information state is um, a sort of um, inconsistent information state because you get to say that it rejects every every p trivially and it also rejects it also asserts every p trivially because this is a universal um, joint function. So keep in mind that the empty state is uh, is um, um, behaves weird because that's going to matter. But now uh, for the rest of the language, everything works uh, pretty smoothly. In particular, you have that uh, state asserts not phi just in case it rejects phi. It rejects not phi, it asserts phi. 
an unconditional square assertion rejection and disjunction, which I will say more in a minute. And uh, through these um, clauses, you see it, 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 you know, it follows that the, um, the empty state trivial asserts and trivial rejects everything. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So here, what, 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 another thing that I want to say is that this, this operator, mm -hmm, this type of negation here, you get it for free, so to speak, right? As soon as you have assertion and rejection, then you just, you just get something to switch, to switch them around. But again, it's not going to be the meaning of the word, the word not. Uh, it's just something that codifies rejection uh, because all of its properties depend on, on the properties of assertion and rejection. Okay, so to get more of a feeling for, uh, uh, in particular for, for, for disjunction and conjunction. So here I repeat the, the uh, assertion conditions for disjunction and the rejection conditions for conjunction because they're mirror images of each other. This is called split disjunction. Uh, it's something I took from, uh, from Aloni, from Cresswell's work on, uh, on semantics for intuitionistic and classical logic. It's also uh, comes from team logic, a bunch of other things. So uh, just to, that's just to say that it's relatively understood how it behaves. The idea here is that a disjunction is asserted in a, in a state, just in case the state can be split into two substates, P and T prime, um, uh, uh, each of which asserts one of the divisions. Um, so, for example, look at the figure up here. In particular, consider state S, which is um, that diagonal state that includes WP and WQ, where WP is uh, supposed to be a word in which P is true and Q is false. WQ is a word in which Q is true and P is false, and so on. Now, because S is the union of two states, the singleton of those words, one that asserts P and the other that asserts Q, S supports the disjunction for Q. But also, negation, and insofar as you have the negation by switching around assertion and rejection, this thing is going to be non classical. And that's how you can see it because uh, the state S also rejects P because it contains a word in which P is false. And uh, it rejects Q because it contains a word in which Q is false. So it rejects. P or Q, and so it asserts negation of P or Q. So the state, the same state as both asserts P or Q and asserts its negation. You get this weird phenomenon. Um, so that's some point and point. And the final point that I want to highlight about this picture is the state T, which is which is just this, the single term of WP. That's what's called the zero model. Uh, what does of the disjunction? And what that means is, well, it just uh, notice that it is a model of the disjunction. It, it, it does support, it, it's, a, it's an information state where you can assert the, the disjunction. And that's because you can look, if you think of it as the union of two substates, itself and the empty state, itself P asserts P because all of its words are P words, and the empty state trivially asserts anything, including Q. So, in a sense, this is contains enough information to assert the disjunction, but it's a zero model. And what that means, it's meant to uh, highlight the role of the empty state in this. This is particularly important because of my next assumption, which is neglect zero. The core effect of the neglect zero assumption is to disallow zero models. So exactly the kind of uh, sort of trivial or triviality based models for disjunction that I just introduced. Uh, and that's important. Uh, and my justification for doing that is because we want to distinguish grounds, different grounds for asserting and rejecting. So one thing is to assert a disjunction uh, non-trivially, because you have possibilities in which one disjunct is true and another disjunct is true. And another thing is to assert a disjunction trivially, because you can assert a disjunct. Um, that's the intuition this is meant to capture. And what I want to say with the neglect zero assumption is that there is a cognitive tendency uh, that you can observe uh, and applies, hopefully applies to speakers. This again is kind of speculative, by which they tend to neglect zero models. This uh, comes from Maloney's account of free choice, it's crucial 
or, or stuff. And, um, and there are different imp possible implementations of this assumption. This is my implementation. I'm using this operator, the star, it's a speech act operator. And what it does, it refines the grounds for asserting a rejection by running out the empty state. So basically, this notation here means that the uh, state S asserts by non trivial and likewise for rejection. Um, this is how the star is defined. Um, look, a state asserts an atomic formula non trivially just in case it asserts P and it's not empty. It rejects the form, it rejects P non trivially if it rejects P and it's not empty. And then beyond that, I, uh, I, I claim it's a speech act operator, so it's kind of insensitive to the syntax of the formulas. It sort of trickles up and down uh, like that. On the basis of this, now we can go back to our little diagram and see how it works. So I, I, said, I said earlier that state S asserts P or Q. It also asserts P or Q non trivially because you can find two sub, non empty substates. One which, one which supports P and the other supports Q. Then I said that P, the singleton here, also asserts the disjunction, but it's a zero model. And what that means is it does not support the disjunction on trivial precisely because you need an empty state to assert one of the disjuncts. Uh, now, this is uh, just a feature of these models. Uh, so the sailor's sentence is positive um, uh, if every atom every atom in the sentence, every atomic formula in the sentence is in the scope of an even number of negations, it's negative if and only if every atom in the sentence is in the scope of an odd number of negations. What the definition means is that just fix ideas. For example, P or Q is positive, right? Not P is negative. Not P or Q is also negative, and then you have uh, formulas that are neither. And the generalization is that um, is this thing that I'm calling lexical rejection. If I is a positive formula, then if it's non trivially rejected in a state, it's non trivially rejected in all its super states. And intuitively, you can see this because think about this for a second state T rejects Q non trivially because Q is false. In the one only word that it contains. And so all of the superstates of T are going to contain that one witness against the truth of Q, right? Um, okay, another nerdy way of saying this is that rejection of positive sentences that we want. But thanks to this, I get to have the inferences that I want. So this is the free choice like inference that we begin with. Uh, it holds under the star. So if a certain rejection are non-trivial, then you get to have this disjunction to conjunction of details. You also have the opposite direction, both on the on the uh, neglect zero assumption and without it. So because this is classically valid, so it remains like. Uh, and therefore we we can state this equivalence. Um, and I'm gonna ah and this is important. These validities, and what I'm doing is I'm giving a semantic model of what the lexicon can express. What that means is it's a model of cross linguistic lexicalization data. We're not supposed to test the validity of this stuff introspectively because even though we are native speakers of various languages, we do not have <coughs> introspective access to cross linguistic data. So the, this equivalence is meant to show that the expressive power of the logic I'm describing matches exactly the expressive power of the lexicon. But now I'm going to skip the details, but basically you get this negative collapse. So you get this equivalence between all of the Morgan formulas under the star. So on the assumption of, of neglect zero. And the classically valid internments are also classically valid in general, so uh, without the star. Um, which allows me to say that if we consider the absurdity free fragment of this logic, so essentially the same logic, but in which you only have uh, models that do not include the empty state, uh, all negative De Morgan sentences are mutual. That was the first one of, one of the three desiderata. Uh, another one was that uh, conjunction and disjunction behave well, which they do. So disjunction follows from efficient, but conjunction doesn't. 
and well, so on. This is all familiar. Uh, and finally, you don't have triviality because uh, while you can infer a disjunction from addition and uh, a non trivial assertion of, of this doesn't tell not phi, you must not equivocate between asserting a disjunction as sort of because you have, you have grounds for asserting addition and asserting a disjunction non trivial. Um, Moreover, that's the final desideratum. Uh, this one negative meaning that you can formalize, you can you can formalize in various ways with the negation, wide scoping or narrow scoping with this or that operator in the middle. Uh, that one negative uh, formula um, uh, captures the meaning of nor, meaning as exemplified here. You need so it would be something like. And did not go to the restaurant, and Bob did not go to the restaurant, therefore neither and nor Bob went to the restaurant. And then from neither and nor Bob went to the restaurant, and from the and did not go to the restaurant. Okay, so this inferential behavior is captured, uh, as you can see here, uh, by this expression. So uh, this logic expresses nor, it does not express NAND. Um, and uh, well, then I have some more about this junction, but I must keep it in this sense for the rest of the time. Uh, final thoughts. Well, how do we get classical logic? I said that given the bilateral setting, this operator uh, given by polar rejection is available for free. But of course, it's not the meaning of not because it behaves weird. All right. Uh, so, hypothesis of word negation, not the word not, explicitly <coughs> classical rejection, which is a stronger notion of rejection. So the idea, basic idea, is that the speech act of rejection is characterized as non-assertion. That was the notion of polar rejection. But then the function of the word not in, in natural language is to express a stronger notion of rejection. This is, why is it stronger? Because in, if for, with polar rejection, you say that a state rejects P, it's either empty or it fails to assert. Classical rejection demands that the state rejects P just in case all of its substates are either empty or filled or so. And with that, uh, you what you get is well, you keep the same assertion condition from the atoms, namely, you need unanimity among the words to assert. This thing entails that you need unanimity among the word of the words also to reject. Um, and uh, the final thing that I'm going to, and, and then with these assertion rejection conditions uh, imposed by classical rejection. And then the truth conditions I gave you earlier for these symbols, uh, without, the, without mentioning the neglected assumption, that's, the, the, that's classical logic. So summarizing, classical logic is obtained by one strengthening rejection. And that's the particular, that's in particular what non adds to just polar rejection. And allowing reasoning from uncertainty, which means we now forget about the neglect zero assumption. And we do that because in classical logic, you know, it's just possible to reason from uncertainty. So we, we just have need to build that back in. Note, however, that it might there might still be a use for the neglect zero assumption if we want to talk about the natural things in language. That's what Maria Loni had done with it for free choice. It's just that if we really want to get back to classical logic, we need to have a way of reasoning from absurdity. So this is the upshot. I gave the two tier model. The first part is LC star. This expresses the lexical connectives and or and or. And this is a model of the expressive power of the lexicon. Um, the second tier is what you get by uh, uh, introducing classical rejection, which I think is what not contributes. And then, in addition, also systematically allowing the, the zero models back here. Uh, and this is going to be a model of expressive power and natural free language. So the hypothesis is that with just assertion and rejection and this uh, neglect of zero models, that's the basis on, uh, which gives you the space of meanings that can be conventionalized and lexical level. Future work. Well, work out the connection between dynamic and, st and the static parts of this talk, extend it to quantification conditions. And then I said a bunch of things 
about people's cognitive states. Um, I described the updates as these procedures would be the revised release, and I made this assumption about the black zero. It would be nice in the future to do something more concrete about that, but this is it. Thank you.